grab your popcorn and snacks, find a comfy spot, take a seat or lie down, and let me transport you to a place of fantasy, ghost stories, ancient legends, odd creatures, alien encounters, and other magical topics. You may even decide to join the conversation. From faraway lands to your own backyard, with a small dash of pixie dust, turn out the lights and open your minds. The journey is about to begin. Hey, 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 welcome. Oops, look at that. I'm sharing the screen. Wrong button. That's okay. Okay, welcome. It's going to be one of those nights. You can tell already, guys. I want to welcome you guys to the show. My name is Charlotte. I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so. Can you believe it? We're already in February. God, everything went so fast. In fact, I want to give you guys some info. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, though. My birthday was yesterday, February 2nd. I'm a groundhog baby. But I stopped counting. When, when, when I hit 30 years old, I stopped counting. It's okay. W- women can do that. Women can stop counting. Anyway, I want to welcome everybody here. I'm the owner of the California Haunts Paranormal Investigation Team based out of Sacramento, California. You can find us at www.californiahaunts.org. And we are 35 strong up and down the state of California. We also have uh, affiliates in Oregon, Washington, Nevada, and Hawaii. Someday I'll get the Hawaii to go hunt. Not now. But anyway. I want to welcome everybody here. We have a great guest tonight. As you probably already have heard me say over and over on the show, my actual job is a freelance journalist, but I was a journalist, a desk journalist for years. And for six years, for six of those years, I was a crime beat reporter. So uh, my my guest tonight uh, comes true to my heart because that's what she writes about is different types of crimes. And she's got a brand new book out and we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to hear about that. So I'm brought in with names. So I'm going to try this name. Her name is Mitzi Zareto. See if I got the name right. We'll find out when I get her on. She can yell at me and call me names or whatever. But uh, we'll see if I got the name right. But I'm really excited to have her on to talk about her book. So without further ado, here we go. Hi. Hello. You were you were close, but not <laughs> quite there. It's Zareto. Zareto. What nationality are you? Hungarian. Oh, I knew it. Yeah, so well, you know, I, you know, Central Europeans love their Zeds. Yeah, I was thinking when I was looking at that a little few minutes ago. I, I, I thought of Subo, right? You know, the last name Subo. I'm Hungarian too. Are you? Oh my goodness! My last name is Kosha. Well, bring out the goulash. See, there we go. <laughs> yeah, except I didn't that don't eat meat anymore. It has to I be vegetarian. So about you know, ten minutes before the show, and I thought, I bet she's Hungarian. Wow, that's really cool. Well, so you know, cool. if you've got if you've got any Hungarian relatives that speak Hungarian, you need to show them my last name, and they'll give you a chuckle when they tell you what it means. <laughs> I'll have to do that. Yeah, I'll have to do that. So, tell me about you. How did a nice girl like you end up writing story books like this? <laughs> well, you know, I kind of bounce around a lot with genres and um, it just, uh, I've, re- I've done crime fiction before, but uh, it just ended up where um, I, I, I sort of hooked up with a, with a publisher I used to work with in a, at another publishing house and we were just banding around ideas and whatnot. And um, uh, we just sort of uh, were chatting about maybe doing some true crime. And um, basically, you know, when I start something, I... I get really stuck into it. And so it seems to be working because um, we're going to be talking about my fifth book in my series. So That's awesome. How do you research these things? Well, I mean, I guess after a certain amount of time, I remember as a reporter, you could, you, you can get access court files and there is a statute of limitations on some of this stuff too. So is that what's happening? You're able to go back through all, all the old court files and all that? Well, in in the case of these in in the series in the best new true crime story series, it's actually antho- an anthology. So I have multiple writers, uh, including me, of course. And so uh, everyone approaches their story differently. Um, obviously, if it's a, if it's something historical, they can find out, um, you know, through research, maybe uh, archives, records, whatnot. Um, uh, I think probably everyone sort of covers their story in a different way. Uh, some might be even first person, I've had first person true crime stories. Um, So as far as me personally, uh, I just go and cover every corner of the internet that I can possibly cover, uh, look into archives, uh, 
I I haven't really done anything historical. I've I've been mostly doing uh, more contemporary pieces, and uh, and then to be honest, the biggest the biggest challenge in true crime is is cross checking all your facts because. You know, there are so many errors out there, and some of those errors are coming from, say, a major newspaper, right. which you think would get it right, and they don't get it right. I think a lot of the case with that, in defense of newspapers, is they're usually writing on deadlines, so they're usually sitting in on the court trial itself. And by the time you get done, because you're not allowed to take recorders in or anything like that. So by the time you get done, you're, you're scribbling notes down. It's usually your deadline's at 6 p.m., you get done at 5.30. <laughs> And you go, well, right this is true. This thing out. So, you know, yeah. but, but then again, there's really no excuse for um, screwing up either. No, I mean, I give people a deadline, but they usually have several months of a deadline. So, uh, but, but I mean, I actually have, um, I, I, I was a journalism major for my undergrad. So, I mean, I kind of, I understand how that goes, but um, the thing is, though, it's like Chinese whispers. You know, you'll have a, a something wrong, and it just gets repeated and repeated and repeated, and suddenly it's all over the place. So it's like, oh, so it's it's a challenge to write the stuff. And then, you know, when I get in the stories from people, I'm kind of like, you know, I have to go and fact check it because I I can't hire a fact checker to check all this stuff and publishers don't do that anymore it's just not they don't they don't you know employ fact checkers it's just not affordable so oh, um no. yeah and i really i really sympathize with with um true crime writers that do say a, a an entire book based on one story because uh that is just scary stuff to have to just do one particular thing and all that fact checking. Uh, I mean, I've heard that s some of these people spend thousands uh, having professional fact checkers go over it because somebody, you know, the publishers don't cover that cost. Right, right. You know what I've heard? I, I heard that the most, I'm just checking something. I had that. Do you have bats down. flying around or something? It's no, I, had, I had put this tile up the other day, you know, for extra sound tile in here. And I was actually, because every Sunday I, I, I do a book read, like like something ghost related, like right now it's the Ghost of Flight 401. So the tile didn't take to the uh, stuff I, I had glued it on with, and it all came down on me during the book <laughs> read. And I was real calm when I looked up and I said, no, it's not the ghost. I'm good. You know, but it all came to, that's why it looked like it might be peeling down, but it's not. Just didn't check. Just it could be an earthquake. earthquake. Could be an earthquake, especially here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not you know, to worry. <laughs> it's not a problem. It's a ghost. Not to worry. Just like that tsunami. tsunami. Yeah, what's yeah, to worry? What <laughs> it's what I do. I'm trying to be calm, just like a cop. It's all good. No problem. Um, I'm fascinated, you know, like like I was, I was going to say before I turned around was, I know one of the most, um, I'm going to call it anal, because one of the most anal fact check books is Reader's Digest. It, is, is what? Reader's Digest. They are really oh. anal about fact checking stuff. Oh well, they they must be one of the rare ones. I mean, I, I mean, even magazines. I, I I think I think if you're perhaps if you're doing a a, a story for a very very high profile magazine, they yeah. do employ fact checkers. But yeah. that's yeah, yeah it's, it's just not the rule anymore. No, it's. Not. I mean, I I have to put, I put a disclaimer in the book at the beginning because I mean, you know, I'm not perfect. My writers aren't perfect, and we do the very very best that we can. Um, yeah. I would hate to think we've had any errors slip in there if there are they're probably pretty minor but um you know you for legal reasons you have to say look you know this is as, as true as we think it is and as we've looked at it and, and right, right, you know, right. yeah, yeah, i mean i'm pretty confident i'm pretty confident that you know we're pretty spot on with everything right. um so <laughs> i would think the ones that are doing all the fact checking are the ones that have a lot of money to invest in the fact checkers otherwise Whoever's writing on deadline is going to write on deadline, and that's what they're going to go with, you know. And uh, yeah, I, I've, I've fallen victim to that over the years too. Right. Yeah. Well, that. that's why I always tell everyone: look, um, don't just rely on one source, and and especially, you know, especially when you see a lot of errors show up in things like blogs. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's kind of a big culprit. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me about your book. You just wrote this book. And how many books have you written? Let's go to that first. Oh, God. Well, I don't know. I mean, I've been I've been at this gig for quite a while. Um, I, I mean, the true crime series is um, when did I even start? You know, I don't know what year it is anymore. Um, <laughs> I, I think I think it's I, I think I'm a, when I turned 30. I have no idea what year it is either. 
Oh yeah, thirty. My God, yeah, the the brain's going already. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's actually uh, just about my two year anniversary for the series, the best, the best new true crime story series. I mean, in total, how many books I've done, I, I don't even know. It's been it's definitely at least um, pushing 30. <laughs> OK, OK. okay. <laughs> but this particular series, this is book five. OK, so tell me about your book. Well, I'm going to flash it. Excuse me for right flashing. Oh, you got it flash. I, I told you. <laughs> I got you covered. You got me covered. Yay. <laughs> oh, well, um, as I said, this is book five. Um, each uh, book in the series has a different theme. Um, I'm, I'll just preface it. The first one was on serial killers. The second one was on small towns. Um, the third one was uh, well-mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. Uh, the fourth one was crimes of passion, obsession, and revenge. And that kind of what worked as a nice segue into partners in crime. Um, and essentially what this book covers is uh, people who are involved in a relationship, romantic, sexual, whatever, but they team up to commit crimes. And um, it's it's a fascinating dynamic because, I mean, I mean, we have we got all kinds of criminals. I mean, we all know about serial killers, et cetera, et cetera. But imagine that two people in a relationship actually get together to commit crime. That's something um, very interesting to look into. Uh, and the stories in the book are cover all all manners of crimes. It's not just, I mean, there's plenty of murder in it. So if you <laughs> enjoy reading about murder or you're fascinated by murder, there's it's well represented, but we've got fraudsters, we've got arsonists, um, all kinds of stuff going on. And um, Aside from just the actual crimes themselves, uh, there's discussion about maybe what what is it that got these people together? What what happened that um, was it somebody who sucked sucked the other person in to join them? Uh, are they equal partners in crime, uh, etc.? So uh, I think it's a, a good range of stories, and and people interested in this will find something fascinating and a, something to take away from it. Were you able to interview any of the people in the book at all? Uh, well, like I said, there's, there's, uh, I think we've got 15 stories in total. So we've got 15 different writers uh, of whom I'm one. Uh, in my particular story, no, I did not get to interview anyone for that story. But I have in the past, um, uh, one piece, I, I called it, it was probably... Um, the, one of the hardest things I've ever done was uh, when I wrote a piece for my small towns book, and it was about a um, a spree killer in the Pacific Northwest. And um, I was very fortunate in that uh, a friend of mine is a retired police lieutenant, and he knew uh, several of the uh, police officers who worked the case. So I had access to these guys and was able to interview them for the story and get totally new content um, that the newspapers didn't get. So that was that was pretty cool. That is cool. So can you tell me, you know, we don't want to give the whole book away, obviously, yeah. but uh, what's one of the stories that, sta that, that stands out to you? Um, oh gosh, you know, that's like, <laughs> how do you pick which is the favorite or stands out the most? I mean, they're all good stories in their own right. They're all very unique stories in their own right. Um, for, well, for instance, I could mention my story, um, sure. which I actually, that's another kind of crime. It was about uh, human trafficking okay. and, and people who, who hooked up and they were essentially legally human traffickers so um it's kind of but which one which one stands out is hard you to say it's kind of timely right now if we talk about that one too considering what's going on with epstein and everything oh definitely definitely um this is exactly this uh the, well the story i wrote since we're kind of talking about that is called 10 floors of whores and that is actually a name that was given by the press it's not my title <laughs> just clarifying that um, cool. <laughs> and and it was it's about um a young couple in london who um decide to uh start an escort business um it's actually a hungarian woman she's uh who, who lives in london and her husband who is british and ironically he's a uh, special police constable for the london met 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, interestingly, the the woman had experience already um, in prostitution, but she um, she and her husband decided to start an online escort agency, and they were importing young women from Hungary. And um, if people are familiar with uh, human trafficking and sex trafficking in Europe, uh, uh, Romania and Hungary are top of the list for bringing people over for sex trafficking. Um, it's 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 a really serious situation, and you know these people. <laughs> Yeah, you know, people. Someone might say, "Oh, wasn't it a victimless crime? These women from Hungary, some of them were already sex workers." But you know, in a court of law, that is that's human trafficking. Very interesting. So, what happened with these guys? How did they get? They're getting obviously they got caught. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, um, they were they were certainly having a good time on this money they were making off these uh, these women, you know, and 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 most of these women were um, they were desperate, you know. I mean, as I mentioned, I mentioned the other day, I was chatting with someone for an interview, and uh, a lot of countries in in Central and Eastern Europe, when communism left. Um, it, capitalism came in. It wasn't just, hey, this is fabulous. We're all capitalists now. Money, money, money. That's not true. Um, a lot of people have been left behind when communist, communism left and uh, ends up in, in very dire straits. And so uh, these women, you know, they, they had, uh, they needed money. Uh, a lot of them had families that were struggling. So, um, to them, the thought of like flying over to London, all expenses paid, and being put up in this uh, in, in Chelsea of all places, which is, um, if you know London at all, Chelsea's uh, very posh, very expensive. This is, you know, one of the best neighborhoods you can find. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it must have seemed like a dream to come over. Um, and if they were sex workers already in Hungary, uh, you know, they probably weren't making much. The conditions were probably not so great. Um, so it seemed like a great, great plan to go over to, to London and work. But the reality wasn't quite the same. Um, and their so-called employers were really uh, enjoying the money they were making. They were spending money left and right. Um, people who, who lived like in the neighborhood where this couple lived were wondering, how the hell are these people having packages delivered every single day? Things keep arriving and no one seems to have a job. Um, where's this money coming from? That's interesting. Um, so how many, how, how many jobs, I don't know if I want to use the word jobs or what, but I mean, how, how busy were like like you were talking about the packages? How how busy were these people, as far as you know, uh, the I guess the the uh, jaunts that they had coming in. Well, uh, as I said, they were uh, the, the uh, women were advertised online uh, okay. and through their main uh, escort uh, agency, okay. but they would also get sort of cross advertised at other. Uh, site websites as well um you know the the escort business in london is quite popular i mean like if you go into a phone kiosk generally there's a million business cards and they're all escorts I like <laughs> you know, I, so so it's a very competitive business right. so what they so what they did this couple actually rented a flat in this building called the chelsea cloisters um which you can find online um it's like a hotel apartment type of a setup and uh you know it's it's generally they so they supposedly cater to travelers and to people who maybe are coming over for business for maybe they don't want to stay in a hotel and they right. you know they want like a self-contained little apartment or flat um which is a which sounds fantastic right um but you know uh the business, basically, and it wasn't just this couple either. A lot of people have been using flats in this building, in this block of flats, for as as a brothel. Um, so you have this atmosphere of, of of sex workers running in and out, in and out, and meanwhile you've got like you know the family visiting from somewhere, and they're staying in a flat, and they're like, what? Um, and and the odd thing, what's 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 particularly funny about this is that the owner of the block of flats is a multi-millionaire or billionaire uh, in, in London. Um, and he supposedly didn't know about it until uh, it came out later on that there's, you know, <laughs> this, this place is a brothel. 
essentially a brothel is happening inside your building. Wow, wow, wow. So yeah. uh, the, 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 what, was there a raid by the cop, or by, by the bobbies, or, or how'd that work? No, not really, not really. I mean, um, it was, it was um, funny enough, like I said, that when they came out, when this couple was finally busted for what they were doing, and there was human trafficking charges brought against them and all these other charges, um, a, a, a newspaper, a major newspaper, was not quite buying the fact that uh, everyone was claiming this building wasn't being used for sex work. And they actually found that they could set up appointments very easily with uh, various women working the building. So, uh, you know, the likelihood it's it's probably still going on. Yeah. And, um, you know, how, how no one, how everyone claimed ignorance of it is is quite mysterious. I, I make a little joke in my story about if it was any more obvious, you'd have Sting stay outside singing Roxanne. That's funny. Yeah. I mean, it's like everybody in London knows about it. And then suddenly the owner and no one else. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Were you able to add the book? Um, no, that's, that's just incredible that that could go on. I mean, here you've got family, like you say, you've got families in there and everything and everybody. Oh, yeah. I mean, they would. Uh, it would be quite common to have uh, escorts cards slid under the door. Um, I mean, there were stories of people like someone ringing your doorbell, and it was some guy looking for the escort he has an appointment with, and this woman's like, "This is not their flat." <laughs> you know? That's funny. I know. I mean, can you imagine the things that happen when when you're here not hanging out there, right? I mean, I, I, I'd probably be on the floor. It'd be so funny. Well, you know, they don't, you know, they don't know. I mean, there, so there was some woman who was, uh, had a, a flat there, or I'm sure she's probably long gone, but she was like embarrassed to tell people where she lived, you know, it's just. Because it was going on. That's a, that's a, that's, that's a great story. That's terrific. So are there any, um, cause I know there's, um, kids that get together too like you know like 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 teenagers and stuff that the boyfriend will kill for for, for the girl or whatever did, did you find anything like that oh yes 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 there's definitely the well represented with that um there are actually there's there's two stories in there like that um i'll have to actually zip through my book because <laughs> just to make sure i tell you which ones okay, sure um Ba, 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 ba. we've got okay anything from my darling a murder in the name of love and that was the that's actually a very famous case uh you know charles starkweather and Carol Ann oh Fugate. yeah 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 Charlie Charles yes Charles. yes from the 50s and that's exactly um what that was i mean you've got this uh guy he's um i think he was in his early 20s and and the girl's like 14, which is, you know, that's pretty dodgy already. Yeah. <laughs> what is a 14 year old girl doing with this grown man? But, um, you know, she, they, they hook up and, uh, uh, we just have her families, you know, mass, he mass murders her family. Uh, then they go off on the run and they just, uh, kill, kill, kill. Um, there doesn't seem to be any remorse. Um, it, it could be something like, oh, I need to hang out, you know, hide out at your house. So let me kill you. Uh, I need your car. I'll take the car. I'll kill you. I mean, this just just went on and on and on until they were finally caught. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a very famous case. And, and, and I was obviously, you know, it's when you're doing true crime and you want stories, it's it's getting harder and harder to find anything that hasn't been covered. Um, mm -hmm especially, you know, there's so many TV shows, there's podcasts, et cetera. But what, what was interesting about this story is the, um, the writer, the way he wrote it, you, you feel like it's like you're right there, you know, almost like you're watching a film and it's written in that particular way. And I felt that that kind of made the story stand out a little bit because you felt that, um, um, like I said, it, it was if you were you were on the journey with these people, and 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 that just kind of gut wrenching. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Well, yeah. You know, what's very interesting about it, like you say, it's 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 you know married couples will do stuff. You got the younger kids with the younger kids. It's hormones. You know, it's like like even with Stark Weather, I would think. Well, oh, I know his story too. But some of these kids, when when you see their stories, and I, I I'll say it, ID Discovery. There's a plug. You know, when you see these things on ID Discovery, it's because the hormones are racing. 
Well, this is true. This is this is true. Uh, I mean, in this particular case, uh, we've got a, a very young girl who fancies herself in love with this guy. And obviously her parents are saying, no, 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 this, this, this is not appropriate at all. And uh, you're going to rebel. And the more the more they say no, the more you're going to rebel. And so uh, it just sort of went from there. And then the, you know, Charles, he probably figured, um, well, you know, this, this is my woman and no one's going to stand in our way. And, uh, when you've got somebody who's already perhaps got a few screws loose, <laughs> this is what results. Absolutely. And then, you know, uh, but go ahead. yeah, I was going to say there, there are some other, uh, as well with young people who um, <laughs> go way out there as far as uh, committing murder and whatever, and they're in a relationship. Uh, what what I what I think is interesting is that when everyone finally gets busted, when they're finally you know up there and they they have to uh, atone for their crimes and their their life is on the line, uh, the love suddenly disappears, and it's yes. like no 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 no, it wasn't me. He made me do it. You know. Yep. Suddenly it's the other person's fault. That's just how it yeah. is. That's how, yeah. that's how it is. I know it, uh, go, going into the jails to interview guys. Sorry? Know, uh, like the times I had to go into jail to, to interview, you know, people. It's always they didn't do it. That's all well, understand. this is, yeah, I, I think that's sort of a, a, a cliche, but, but <laughs> then again, on occasion, though, on occasion, they didn't. <laughs> or the guy, I had one guy tell me, well, the gun was under the chair, it was under the car seat, but I had no idea it was there. I swear, well, I, I swear I didn't know it was there. And you're just going, yeah, whatever, dude. Okay. You just, hey, you listen, just I mean, you know, we all, we've all done it. We've, well, well, hopefully we've not committed murder and say we didn't do it. But I mean, we've all kind of like not wanted to own up to something, especially yeah. when you're a kid. <laughs> If you're an adult, I suppose, you know, you you know, when you're desperate and you're scared, you're going to um, find some excuse. I mean, that's just human nature. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, you look this stuff up, you're reading through it, and does it make a lasting impression on you? Um. <laughs> yeah, that, that's like, well, let's, well, I do have nightmares, but funny enough, they're never about these things. <laughs> I don't know what's up with that. I get, I have these same recurring themes in my, in my nightmares or dreams or whatever you want to call them, but it's never anything from my books. So I'm not quite sure what that's about. But, um, you know, when, when I'm stuck into a specific story, like when I'm doing the editing or if I'm doing the writing, um, you, you do kind of go in the zone, but, um, you've got to kind of put that aside though, for, for your own sanity when, when it's done, it's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's enough for now. <laughs> Has there ever been, you know, because you've written these five books already, has there ever been a particular story that really, really bothered you? Oh, well, there's a lot of really uh, bothersome stories. I mean, uh, it's, it's like when, when I did the serial killers book. I mean, there's some not, some pretty nasty characters in there. Um, I think I'm pretty good at com compart com I can't talk. It's it's late for me. Compartmentalizing. If did I say that right? <laughs> Does that to me all the time? I don't know. I, it's just like, yeah, I, I hardly speak anymore. All I do is communicate <laughs> electronically. It's like my voice is gone. But um, I, I think I really can put things in a box so uh -huh. that I'm not haunted by them. Um, because, I mean, for your own sanity, really, you know, you, you have to do that. I suppose it's like if you were if you were a, a, in law enforcement and you right. see some pretty horrendous things, um, you've got to try to set that aside for your own sanity or else you're going to be a basket case. That's and I mean, point. unfortunately, a lot of law enforcement people um, are suffering yeah. uh, with mental illness because of what they've experienced. I can see that though, because I know I used to have to go cover a lot of auto accidents. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so it got to the point where I don't, I don't want to say I was numb to them, but it just got to the point where I was like, okay, this is what's going on. And then I, then I got to the point where I could walk around the accident scene and go, oh, the car went off over here. You can see where it slid that way, you know. So, so you get like yeah. that after a while, looking at this stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, you have to kind of just be uh, analytical about it and, and approach it in that way, because uh, especially for, for writing, you know, I mean, you, you've got to, you know, I like to have each, you know, when the stories come in, I like things that have some analysis in them. But um, yeah, you've got to remove yourself somewhat. I mean, there's just... <laughs> You know, if you can't, then you probably shouldn't be doing it because, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, when you start reading about, you know, guys like, like, like Kemper, Ed, Edmund Kemper, or somebody like Bundy, or even, um, who was the guy that, that, that was boiling body pieces and stuff in his house? Oh, 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 uh, Dennis Nilsson? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, he's in the serial killers book, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had Richard Trenton Chase living like three blocks away from me. Oh, yeah. You know? And my dad was one of these guys. He, he was a, 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 a ambulance chaser. Oh. So if something big happened, that's how I ended up such a good crime reporter because I was used to jumping in the car, and, you know. And so we would be there. So he would drive by, you know, Trenton Chase's house and go, yeah, there's, that's where Richard lived. Oh, you grew and up he, with it. You were, you were spoon fed ambulance chasing. Yard, yeah. Yeah, so, so so my dad had me doing all that stuff, you know. Oh, well, you know that's the one thing that kind of put me off journalism. Um, I mean, I think that um the journalism studies, funny enough, that they they sort of came back all these years later when I got back to true crime because it was like, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's you know I'm putting my journalism hat back on, but um I didn't really feel comfortable comfortable you know like for instance um when we were assigned the thing like you have to go to court you have to cover a case you know blah blah I felt like I was I just felt like I was invading people's privacy I wasn't right. I wasn't happy with that and and uh, especially some sometimes when the journalist has to get really in your face uh, to get the story to get the quote um it's just not something I want to do and I certainly would you know because i would feel the same i wouldn't want it done to me and i just right, didn't right. want to make a career out of doing it to other people and so um some people might say hey you know you're doing true crime well, isn't that what you're doing but i'm very careful that um it's it's approached in such a way that people are not going to feel exploited uh, I just don't think that is good true crime if you're actually exploiting somebody right. more and more and, and victimizing them more and more. I, I think I, I, I've got a, a tagline um, on my website and I someone actually said it to me and I, I said I like that as I'm going to use it as a tagline, but true crime with a conscience. So okay. I'd like to hope that's what I'm producing in these books. I feel the same way too. Now that I'm retired away from it, but I can remember times when I was in court and say a 17 year old gang member had killed somebody and the mother comes in and the mother's just in tears. Yeah. Because it's her kid. And then it's, go interview, go interview that person. <laughs> but she's so upset about her kid or after someone gets killed, a murder victim, right? You, you, you gotta go knock on the front door and that's part of the job. Go knock on the front door and, and talk to the family. Yeah, I, I couldn't do it. I, I kind of knew. I mean, I finished, you know, I finished my studies and whatnot. And then, but but funny enough, is it was as if five minutes after I finished my degree, I said, I want to, I want to get back to writing. I, I actually wrote when I was a kid and I wrote my first novel when I was 10. And so somehow the journalism, despite the fact that I didn't actually use it, um, it, it, it pushed me back into writing because I was going toward a fine arts uh, career. And, uh, but I guess that it flipped a switch and I started to write instead. And, you know, when you start selling some books, it's like, yeah, yeah, I guess I better forget about the painting. <laughs> that's, that's funny too, because yeah, you know, we're a lot alike in a lot of ways, because when I originally went to college, I was going to be doing, I wanted to do special effects for film. And so even though they didn't have those classes there, I was taking things like makeup, stagecraft, you know, lighting, photography, all this stuff. And then eventually I ended up in a journal, the journalism class because there were no English classes available because I started late. And there, you know, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all these years yeah. Later, you know, still doing yeah work. it's funny it's it's funny you know you could just um go in bizarre directions and then maybe something in the past comes back that you can use and it all it kind of like a big we're like big filing cabinets <laughs> yeah yep absolutely now like we talked about you researching these things before um 
obviously you 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 look at newspaper clipping, you know, newspapers. You do you uh, do you go through the court records? Uh, if needed, uh, it depends how extensive uh, for me personally. I know that uh, one of the stories in the Partners in Crime book, um, oh, actually, no, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, the, the book that I have another book coming out in, in September, but one of my writers in that actually uh, had to try to get some records and it was really like pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. But I know some people do uh, get their court records and uh, sometimes you can just find things um, in archives online. Uh, you know, it just depends where you look. Uh, and, and it's like someone, someone once said to me that it's like being in a rabbit hole when you write this stuff. And it is so true because you'll, you'll find one thing and then it's like it sends you off into exploring something else and you find this other thing. And it just is some, it's like this snake that just, doesn't have a beginning or an end. <laughs> Where do you think you get the best information from? Oh, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, generally when I start researching, I'll just start, um, I just start saving um, links mm -hmm. and I'll get paid like a long document of links and it just gets longer and longer and longer and longer. And then I start looking and checking and bouncing off into a different direction. So, I mean, it could be from anything. It could be newspapers, it could be magazines, it could be um, uh, something maybe on television. Uh, yeah, it, it could be from anywhere. Uh, as I said, this, a story I did in the past, it ended up being, um, uh, I didn't even know who, where I came up with the idea from. Uh, I think I just saw an article, I was just researching for something and then I ended up mentioning it to a law enforcement friend and and it suddenly became a story that's cool and then though. that so and then that story took on more roots because i was exploring uh the uh situation with uh mental health in the particular state and um you know it's the drawbacks and the the lack of um, help and funding and so the story kind of became major different 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 dimensions from what i, I thought it would be Interesting. Now, this this last book that, that, that you have, you know, that, that we're talking about today, were you able to find any common threads between the the participants that caused the crimes at all? I'm sorry, what was that? Like, like when you look like you were talking about mental I health and stuff, when you look at all the criminals that that, that you researched, you know, you know, the partners in crime, did you find any, any, anything that they had in common? You know, maybe, maybe something in their backgrounds or, you know. You know, it's it's interesting because some of the uh, some of the cases, it's hard to say why, uh, you know, what was the trigger? It's not something obvious like, you know, you'll say, oh, well, so and so was sexually molested. So they're going to be, a, you know, a sexual sexual molester. Um, it wasn't anything that obvious. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, it's in a way, a lot of the stories, there isn't actually anything too, con too concrete in which to trace why someone became the way that they are. Um, there's one story, uh, it's, it's, in it's, a, it's set in Poland, and it's about a young uh, teenage Polish uh, girl and her boyfriend, and uh, She's basically the the Svengali. She's the big, the main one, totally manipulative, and uh, just drags this guy by his nose essentially to do all kinds of horrible things, and trying to figure out why she was the way she was, other than the fact that she had a controlling mother who um, wanted her to be the best and excel in everything. Um, and like I said, was controlling, but yet was not giving her emotional, uh, anything emotionally, you know, not any real nurturing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that is what resulted in this girl becoming essentially a monster and a manipulative monster. I don't know. But um, yeah, you know, some people just I don't know. I don't know. It's 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 very strange what makes somebody go down a certain dark path. It's not always something that you can just find an easy explanation for. Were there any um, crimes of passion? 
Uh, funny enough, that was the last book, but uh, Crimes of Passion. Well, I mean, I suppose when you when you uh, supposedly kill people in order to get your girlfriend away, uh, that could be called a crime That's of passion. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have a we have a case of ars of an arsonist, serial arsonists, and uh, passion was involved in that because it, it was sort of a, a sexual element with the arson being a turn on, um, and I think that um, that's actually been proven in quite a few arson cases that there was a sexual element involved. You know, the turn on of watching something burn down. I don't know. Just the thrill of it all. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Have you ever um, gone over anything and been shocked by what you uh, read and were about to write? Oh, God, you know, I don't know. I think don't you get to a point where there's nothing shocking anymore. <laughs> true, true, true. I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just sort of... Um, I'm not necessarily looking for uh, content that's going to shock me, but more so uh, how a story is told and if there's a, a personal connection, um, which some of the writers have. And for me, it's really thrilling to get in a, a pitch because I ask people to pitch stories. I don't, I don't take in unsolicited stuff. I say, okay. pitch to me your idea. Um, if the idea sounds promising, and then I'll say, yeah, I'd be interested in seeing it. I'm not giving you a yes. I'm not promising I'm going to publish it, but I'd be interested in seeing it. So we're on the right track. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sometimes I could tell from a pitch if I'm kind of confident that the finished product's going to be what I want. You know, some, you just sort of know. Um, but um, God, I forgot what we, we, your question was. <laughs> what was it? I don't know what the hell it was. Wow. I don't know. I lost track too. It's all good. Oh, shocking, 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 yeah, shocking. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I was sort of, I was sort of saying that for me, I'm, I'm, when it's something like if someone has a connection to the story, that to me is, right. is, is something I'm going to give priority if, if, the, if the finished content comes out really well, because that's, that's kind of an unusual thing to have. Um, mm -hmm. Other than like, say, it's, I guess it's the old Anne Rule thing, you know, her famous book about that Bundy and that she actually was found out the guy she's working with on the volunteer helpline right. or whatever it was, was was the serial killer you know one one in a million or billion yeah chances that's craziness, huh? yeah crazy. so so i mean she's i think i think that whole success she had with that book was because of her personal connection rather than if she just wrote a book about you know serial killing and ted bundy right. um so i'm really thrilled to get in um at least a few stories where there is some kind of connection uh with the writer and the actual crimes or some something some way if it's not the crimes maybe it's you knew these people or whatever so um but as far as shocking um I'm not sure. I mean, you know, you, like I said, I think you just sort of have to compartmentalize it and just look at the content for the sake of the content. Mm -hmm. Now, another question I was thinking, what about the, uh, the legal part of it? I mean, can you get sued for writing about these people? I mean, I'm talking about the ones that are still alive and kicking. Well, that's, you know, something that you have to, when you're writing, you have to make sure that what you're putting in the, in the story, um, is verifiable and and when someone is if say someone's already sentenced to murder and they're in prison well you know that's all documented mm -hmm. so okay. uh, you can't sue someone for 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 actually discussing things that are documented and and were you know in the court or whatever so um there is one story in the book that i had to have some quite a few discussions with the writer about and it's about um fraudsters the husband and wife fraudster team in trinidad and tobago and um in this particular instance they still have not been brought to trial um because the court system and the legal system in trinidad and tobago is horrendously slow i mean it might be maybe another decade before this actually goes to court if not more so we were talking because you know when she pitched the idea i liked the idea a lot and she the uh, writer um lives in trinidad and tobago so mm -hmm. she's right there um so uh, i basically said well you know 
it's how you approach it. Make sure you don't put anything in there like you're actually saying they're guilty when they're not proven guilty. And she turned in a story that was like, oh my God, this is this is perfect. I cannot see that we've got any problems here because the only thing that she's um, said they're guilty of are things that have been proven that they're guilty of. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it is, it is um, mentioned in the story more than once that no, they have not been convicted for this. And, and if they are convicted, if they're not convicted, you know, when they could be convicted. So um, that's probably the only one which does not have an ending as yet. But um, as I said, it was written so that there is, there's nothing in there that you can say was false or, or speculating or whatever. It's, I think it's a pretty fair account. Cool, cool, cool. Now I have a story I can tell you, okay? And I'm not going to mention names in this, but uh, when I was first on the job, there was a horrible accident. Uh, these two girls were walking along the side of the road, and a car swerved and hit them and killed one, one of the girls. And um, so they went searching for the people. It took, it took a while to catch them. And the only reason why they caught them, caught, oh. it turned out to be a, like a 15 or 16-year-old girl that was driving the car. And she had gone home right after that. And her mother had, and then, and then there's a twist to this, where her mother had had a similar accident when she was that age. She had been driving and the sun had been in her eyes and a kid had run out from, from behind a bush. And she killed a kid. Anyway, so the mother decides to protect the daughter. So the mother takes the car. She sends the daughter back to school. The one that, that, that hit the other girl. The mother takes the car to L.A. because her brother had a body shop to have the car repaired. So the brother calls the police and says, look, this car just came in. And it matches the description of the car that hit this girl. So they were able to trace it back. So they, they go and arrest the daughter, put her on trial. They convicted her of, of, of manslaughter. She says that she saw a flash or something underneath the dashboard and leaned over. And that's what caused it. But she didn't notice that the other girl had flown over the windshield. And so she ended up, I think she's, I, I think she's out now out of Juvie Hall. But it was all twisted up because it turns out that the mother had had a similar accident. That the mother had tried to hide, had tried to hide it. Wow. Huh. And I thought if I'm ever going to write a book, that's going to be the one. You know, yeah, I, I mean, the co that is that's really bizarre. I mean, the coincidence of um, the repetition of the same accident. What I mean, yeah. you know, with, with the mother and the daughter, that's mm -hmm. that's bizarre. Yeah. And I remember covering the court trial and how despondent the families were. And, you know, I, I got this picture. They wouldn't let me run it. Uh, the, 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 the girl's aunt was taking a break from court and she, the tears were just flowing. And I had a long lens and I shot the photo and they said, oh, no, we're not going to run this. And I said, why? It's all emotional, you know. But, yeah, so that's if I was ever going to write a book, that would be the one I, I would write about. If I was going to write. Well, one. You know, it's it's actually um, so easy for that to happen. I mean, for instance, the sun in your eyes. I mean, I have felt blinded on, you know, and the, or else something sort of slipped down or you reach down. I mean, that yep. could just so, so easy to happen. I mean, the, the proverbial blink of your eye in your entire life has changed yeah. or destroyed. Yeah. I'm not and someone else's. I just want to, to share that story with you because it's out of all the ones I've co I, I covered in six years, that was about the one, the one that stood out for me that that was the most unique. You know, yeah, but well, it's only adding up like like this, you know. God, <laughs> the only thing I would be thinking, though, in a way, if if you wrote that, if you wrote it, it would be like, well, um, is it going to be reinforcing the pain of everyone again? You yeah. know, yeah, that's. And that, that's the, you know, the one tricky thing with true crime is you want to try to be careful and that, you know, you don't know who's going to be reading this story. And I mean, that's something I'm conscious of, too, that if, if it was somebody related and they're reading it, I don't want to be digging in the knife, you know. Right, right, right. Have you had any, any, any um, calls or anything from family members or emails or anything like that after you read No. This? Okay. 
No, 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 not. And, and I don't believe any of my contributors have had anything either. Um, uh, I mean, as I said, you know, we, uh, I cover a lot of different time frames. I mean, there might be stories that are more contemporary and right. these people are still right. alive or families are still alive or the criminals are still alive. And right. then some are from, you know, years ago and they're long gone. So. You know, I had a conversation. I had a conversation with one of my contributors, and she said, "I only want to write about people who are dead, because then I'm not going to have to worry you about have to it." Worry about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing too, I think too, is a lot of families when something like that happens in a family, they don't want to talk about it anyway. I mean, once the person ends up convicted, even though there, it might be a son that they love, the son they're visiting, the son they're doing this, they really don't want that reputation, you know hovering over the family so so they're not going to discuss it yeah yeah i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't if i were yeah. them would you <laughs> no i wouldn't i wouldn't at all. yeah yeah you know yeah I mean? yeah it just amazes me though you know like like a mother like a mother's love is, is just so much so like like when you see these things and read about these things in books or see them on discovery id discovery you know how much the the mother is crying over the son that, that might have killed a couple people and this and that you know that that, that love is just so much yeah yeah and often sometimes they protect them life them uh you know you, you just i don't know there's there's kind of a line you know it's it, it depends i suppose if it was like you know if it was a, a car accident or hit and run uh but i mean you know if somebody is like a mass murderer i think that's that's kind of a line you have to say you know what i i can't i can't protect and justify this kid anymore kid or you know blood or no blood you know right, there's right, right. Right. Yeah, there's a limit. There's a limit. There's a limit. <laughs> so um, how has the response been to your new book so far? Well, it just came out um, the other day. Okay. And uh, God, I've been so busy, like, you know, kind of, you know, coordinating events and, and interviews and whatnot and promoting. But um, gosh, I don't know. I, I it's, it's it's only been out a short time, so I haven't heard from any readers yet. But I mean, I know it's uh, it was the number one, uh, like, at Amazon new release for like criminal memoirs or some such category. Um, you never know with Amazon. There's so people are always playing around with their alg algorithms. So right, like, right, right. <laughs> I mean, then, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to kind of get noticed there. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, I know like a lot of the contributors, they've got their books already and they are, they are really enjoying them. And uh, some of these contributors are really, really true crime people. And so they've seen and read everything. And, uh, uh, and then of course, when I was um, soliciting to get endorsements before the book was published, um, I, uh, I got very positive uh, feedback from those people. And they were also people who are very experienced having read lots of true crime. So that's, that's nice. But you know the general public likes this stuff. They like to read this stuff. It's popular. I mean, you know, I mean, there's so much of it. Uh, but of course, you know that 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 kind of creates that additional burden that um, you know you do want to put out something with some integrity, not just uh, something that's you know going to attract you know bloodthirsty fans. You know. So when you listen to somebody's pitch, what 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 exactly are, are you looking for as far as as far as the story goes? Um, you know what? I don't really ask people to kill themselves with a pitch. I mean, I'll say just just give me a few sentences, a paragraph. Just tell me um, uh, what what the case is. Uh, you know, I don't know every single case in the entire world, so you know, right. you have to tell me something about it. Um, and then, what is it you're going to say? What? How are you going to approach this? You know, what's what's going to be different about it? And uh, that's. That's it. I'll, I'll collect all the pitches. You know, I start my file with, you know, who sent me what pitch. Um, and then I just wait and see what comes in. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, sometimes I just know from a pitch and their idea and their approach uh, if it's sounding very promising. And I'm generally right. <laughs> you know, when I get excited enough about a pitch, um, I'm pretty much end up accepting it when I just I just know. <laughs> What made you decide to write a, this particular book about about partners uh, in crime? The the partners in crime theme. Uh -huh. 
Well, you know, I have to come up with a different theme for each book in the series. And it's always okay. like, um, what what do I do next? And um, I think this kind of just sort of um, gave birth after having done the uh, Crimes of Passion, Obsession and Revenge book, which is the one that came out before that came out in August. Um, so uh, I, I I don't know. I think it maybe it just felt like a natural segue uh, into this one. Plus, uh, <laughs> I know this is kind of this might sound a little bizarre, but um, it's the book the book with um, Valentine's Day coming out. <laughs> I thought this is kind of an interesting little um, uh, different Valentine's type of. That's thing. pretty funny. Well, yeah. you know, your family found out you were going to be focusing on this type, these types of books. What did your family say? Oh, that's not really an issue. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. What does your mom do? She writes about people that kill people. It's all good. No, I, she's not around anymore. So, but I think she'd be champion, champion, champion. Jesus, I don't know what I can't talk anymore. Champion, <laughs> champion, whatever. <laughs> It's late for you. Man. It's, late. it's early late for me too. I've been up since like six. So it's it's not late, but I don't know. I <laughs> champion championing. Thank you. I get like this that. Is what, I swear to God, this is what comes of doing too much stuff, like constantly communicating electronically, <laughs> COVID, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like best about about writing these things? You see, mean true crime or just mouth. anything? I can't get my mouth to work either. See, sorry, just true crime. What, what you like oh, just true about? crime. Yeah, we like best for writing true crime. Oh, God. I'm gonna say it's it's very hard work. Okay. Fiction is so easy compared to this stuff. I will tell you that. Um, you know, I think I think it's actually seeing that this this whole monstrosity of of various research sources and in and different different uh, links and all this information that you can actually get all this mo monster of information and and somehow bring it together into a coherent story that actually says something and is interesting and engaging um and isn't just rehashing what's already been out there but but puts a different approach or spin on it so i think once it's done once it's done it's satisfying but when you're right in it it's like like, kill me now. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't only write, that's a good segue. We have a good segue now. You don't always write true crime books either, do you? Uh, well, I have been doing this since I started this um, series. This is all I'm doing currently okay. although i've been working on a crime novel which i can never seem to find time for because this stuff is such a time sucker right <laughs> but um i've worked in other genres i mean i've done uh like i said crime fiction before um i've done non-fiction before i've done um parody uh, uh cozy mystery um erotic fiction i've done lots of different stuff you're a busy lady. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm definitely busy. I wish I wasn't as busy. I need a I need a holiday. <laughs> I admire that though. You're it keeps me out of mischief. <laughs> I would like to start writing books at some point. See, so you, you you give me that incentive to do that. I'm giving. Oh yeah. Now you know who to blame when you find out this isn't so it's fun. All your fault. Yeah. I used to think it was hard <laughs> as a reporter, but now oh boy. Why did I listen to Mitzi? That woman. I'm gonna. <laughs> You know, I used to just think it was a pain, and I agree with you. There's, there, there's nothing, and I, I love being a reporter. Don't get me wrong. If there's any editors watching, I love the job. I love, especially crime beat. Loved it, but I hated the court files. I yeah. just hated them because they were always like, you know, I can never get the camera right. Look, look, look. Okay, they were always like this thick. You know, when you got them, it was just insane. <laughs> Having to go through that and sort through it all, you know, you have their side, you know, one side, the other side, their side, the other side, and it's just craziness going through it. Well, see, can you imagine being a lawyer then? I mean, what they yeah. have to go through to find precedence and build a case. I mean, when I was in journalism school and I was taking my journalism law class, I did really well at it. I was like, I got like an A and that was spot on perfect. And my professor said, are you sure you don't want to be a lawyer? I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> no, thanks. You know, to research and stuff and 
my god those some of those books are huge yeah 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 well yeah it's, you know nonfiction journalism true crime uh it's not for the faint of heart it's very very hard work and if it isn't hard work then you're doing something wrong <laughs> well from one, one writer to another um did you enjoy Anne Rule stuff at all? Um, I've actually only read the book, the Bundy book. And um, okay. I kind of, when I was talking about possibly doing a true crime series, that was sort of the go-to book, you know. Plus, actually, I'd had it on my my list in the past, like, as one of the things I wanted to read. And I was just interested in, in seeing her approach. And I'm, I'm so embarrassed to actually say this, but when um, when the first book came out, the Serial Killers book uh, was was coming out, and I was looking for people to endorse the book. I thought of Anne Rule, and then I thought, oh, I found out she was dead. <laughs> I, well, I, I can't keep up with everybody. I actually wrote her once. I asked her advice. In fact, it was on the case I told you about. Was she still alive when you wrote her? Yeah, yeah back way, way back then, like like 11, 12, 13 years ago. And okay. She was very nice. And she told me, and she literally told me, you know, well, if they're still in jail, you know, you can write the book and all this. Because I, I had no clue, because as a reporter, you know, you don't know that stuff. But she was very nice about it. I even explained the case to her. And I said, yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, is it legal for me to, if I wanted to take this up, if I wanted to write it, could I do it? And she was very nice. She sent me like a two-page email. <laughs> That, that's pretty that is nice that's pretty cool well you know? i mean she was from a hardcore journalism background anyway yeah. yeah yeah so yeah so i could tell you from from experience she, she was a very nice lady outside the <laughs> that's fact good to she, know that she wrote about horrible things but she's a very nice lady. <laughs> we're all nice <laughs> and think of her now so think of this you know your book has like a bunch of a bunch of smaller stories in it she would immerse herself in these things and they'd be like like 400, 500 page books. Oh, so yeah. I her, don't, her middle capacity. I just can't people. imagine that. I really cannot imagine that. You know, nothing to take away from what you're doing. Cause I'm saying, you know, what, you know, 15 stories is nothing to sneeze at. Well, I think, you know, everybody's so busy and it's really yeah. hard to kind of like, um, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like I have attention deficit disorder and yes. already, you know what I mean? Like I can't even sit and watch a film. It's like too long, but I can binge watch a television series because right. it's in a one hour bite. Somehow I'm able to do that. But um, as far as, uh, you know, being able to offer these anthologies, it, it kind of gives readers a chance to, um, you know, you get a lot of bang for the buck. You know, right, you're right, going right. to get 14, 15, maybe 16 stories, depending on, you know, how long and whatever I have to I mean, I've got a page limit at some point, right, <laughs> which right. I, I keep exceeding with each book. But, um, uh, you know, you can you can you can dip in and out and you can you can read something and it'll be finished. And right. then you could put it aside. Then you could go back to it so it's it's great if you love true crime and you and and uh maybe you don't want to slog through a whole book or maybe right, your right, attention right. is such i mean i've tried to read some full length full uh true crime books i'm not going to say which one but i i couldn't finish it and it's a book that's very um everyone says it's brilliant and i just i was bored i got you i, got <laughs> I was you. really bored and um so I mean, the, so perhaps for people like me, <laughs> you know, you can dip in and out, and there's lots of different stories, and you get a whole variety, and um, you know, and and then, but they're not like selling you short. It's not like you're going to get right. something that's so condensed that it's not even satisfying. I mean, right. you will, you know, I would hope have some satisfaction after finishing each particular story. Well, I can attest, like, like, like talking about, you know. The, the the emotion that go that goes into just even editing those stories, you know, and, and, and feeling and feeling what the people felt. Covering stuff for a newspaper when you cover it for months on end and you're dealing with both sides of the fence on it, it's emotionally draining. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So I admire you, you I admire you and people like Ann Rule, you know, who who write this stuff because it it, it is draining. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and, and as far as when, wearing my editor's hat as well, yeah. sometimes, um, you know, I might want to guide the writer a bit like, well, you know, have you considered um, perhaps discussing this a little bit or whatnot, you know, seeing where there might be some gaps that could be filled and, and make the story richer, or better. So, um, yeah, there's lots of things to consider. Absolutely, absolutely. This hour just blew by. It has. I yeah, you're of, right. We've been on more than an hour. Yes, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> I, mean, I have too. <laughs> and I was like tired. I was like, oh no, I'm, how am I going to get through this? Is you know, it's like by this time of the evening, I'm usually like just crashed in my pajamas. <laughs> the excitement of a writer's life. Yeah, That's it. yeah. That's it's it. not it's all amazing. champagne and jet setting off to book signings and being schmoozed by publishers. <laughs> I remember those days. I remember getting off work and I remember turning all the phones off in the house. And those were the nights I called let, let, let the drool drop. <laughs> By the time I got done with the week, I was so exhausted. I just sit there right in front of the TV and just, uh, you know. Well, my own, my pleasure in life is at the end, but when it's finally the day is done, the evening is done, I'm finished, whatever it is, I'm shutting the damn computer off once and for all, is I'll start binge watching some crime series. And I'm, I'm right now. Last night. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. There's a good Icelandic one I'm doing now. So I was like, yeah, yeah, this is it. I can't wait. <laughs> I don't know what it was with Hallmark movies and mysteries last night. They, they had two on in a row and then Lifetime had like three. And I couldn't go to sleep because I'm like, hey, this is pretty good. I never seen this one before. So I was up well, there. Well, I'll find like, yeah, I'll be like, one more episode. It's only right, 1 a.m. Right. Yeah. Or I'll, I'll, I'll go to bed after this one and something else comes on. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, that's how it was last night. I mean, I intended to get to bed early and it's not going to happen. I, <laughs> I never get to time. bed early. <laughs> I try so hard, but my dad always said that after midnight, the good stuff comes on TV. <laughs> and that's what happens, you know. By the time I get done in here, I, you know, I, like I'll, I'll produce this show, get the, you know, get the podcast part up, take an hour break for dinner, then I'm up looking for guests, you know, because all the other paranormal shows are on, so I'm up looking for guests. And then I get off. It and never around, ends. Like, what one a.m. or two, and then you're wound up because it's like it's like you're getting off work. Yeah. So then you're in front of the TV and the next thing you know, it's three, four, five. You know, oh, you know, well, I'm not, I have to put a limit on it. If it's going to be close to two, I'm saying that's, forget it. <laughs> you know, so I'm, but those shows are addictive. Like last night, it was like, it was all kidnapping ones, you know. They, they, oh, oh, fun. <laughs> and they, they were like two hour movies, you know, so I'm just like, okay, I'm going to go to bed now. Oh, no, maybe not. You know. You see, this is why you need a DVR. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, seriously. Right yeah, I don't yeah. have DVR going right now. Okay, so that's, sorry. That was my last night. So I, I was up late <laughs> last night watching all these things. Then I thought of you, you know. Just like my guest, because uh, coming up on Monday, <laughs> Robert Robert Letary is going to be on. And he looks at the, the mental profiles of criminals. Oh, fun. Psychopaths and stuff like that. So he's going to be on talking about that stuff. Talk about nightmares. He must have a few. So we're having crime week this, you know, this this coming up here. You know, but uh, I really enjoyed talking to you. And um I would do ne you know your ne next book or the book after that. I'd love to talk to you again. I mean, what you do fascinates me because like I said, I spent six years on a crime beat. And well, uh it's it's never boring for sure, you know, different stories, gang shootings for me, and and like that one I told you about, and then I had one where, where, where the wife you know, this this older woman took out her husband and all this was going on. And, you know, and then I got to visit the coroner's office and, you know, you know it's, it's, it's just, it's it's, fa it's still fascinating for me. I mean, I wouldn't become a crime reporter with not liking it, obviously. Well, but, you know, we'll, we won't be out of business anytime soon, will we? <laughs> no. You know. Well, the crime's never going to go gonna away, let's face it. Yeah, crime, crime's not going anywhere, you know, but uh, I want to thank you. For coming on and I, I do appreciate it i really do and i hope i didn't you know act like an idiot or anything around you but you know that's just how i am well th i thanks for inviting me on i'm glad you found me and i found your email at my domain email i'm like hey this sounds cool all right <laughs> <laughs> we're real loose here you know <laughs> we just let it fly you know that, that's how we are on the show 
but I really appreciate you coming on. And if you wouldn't mind coming on, you know, when, when your next book's out or, or the or the book after that, I would love to talk to you again about this stuff. Absolutely. So I'm fascinated. I'll definitely let you know. I just love this stuff and uh, I could talk about it for hours. I could well, look at we're already going on two hours, you know, hour and a half. So <laughs> <laughs> what time is it where you're at? Uh, I think it's the same time as where you're at. It's 747. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Where are you? Well, you don't have to tell me what I mean. I'm north of you. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Up where it's cold. Ew. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thing on that note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And I, like I said, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'll, this, this, yeah, okay. Hang out, and I'll, I'll uh, talk to you a little bit afterwards, and then we'll call it a night. But thank you so I'll much. I'll see you and, later in the year, then. Yes. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye. 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 Okay, that was a fun interview. It took me back to my roots as a crime court reporter, and uh, I enjoyed it. I really did. I want to thank you guys for coming, and if you like the show, share it with five people. If you hated the show, share it with five of your enemies, because we are equal opportunity here at California Haunts Radio. And if you want to check out our archives, sometimes it's hard to find our YouTube site. So you go to CaliforniaHauntsRadio.com and click on the video on the front page, and that will take you over to our archive. Now, if you're watching from YouTube, uh, there's a little ghost down in the right-hand corner, and it's got a magnifying glass and a Sherlock Holmes hat on. If you click on that, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have hundred, we have more than 170 videos over there of shows that we've done. So you can check out just about almost any topic you can think of, and it's there. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Down at the bottom, you can see the ticker running. California Haunts is a nonprofit organization. So everything you see here, uh, me, not, not me, but my headphones, <laughs> the microphone, the, the lighting and everything comes out of my pocket. So if something breaks, I have to replace it just like paying for the internet and, and, and my stream yard service to do the show. So if you could find it in your heart to donate a little bit to us to keep the show on the air and keep great guests coming like Mitzi, that would be great. Uh, that would be at paypal.me at California haunts. Or if you're uncomfortable with PayPal, we do have a Venmo where if you go into Venmo, just type in California haunts and you can do it from there. I would really appreciate it. Like I said, I want to keep these guests coming. I love doing this. I'm a journalist, photojournalist by trade. So this gives me a chance to do my thing, uh, you know, live. So it's kind of fun. But anyway, again, I want to thank you guys for coming on. And I'm going to go ahead and tease these these three books. Plus, uh, I forgot to ask Missy to put her website out, but I've got that for you right now. So I'm going to say it out loud. Got ahead of myself again, like I always do. So here we go. And yeah. So the website is mitzisereto.com, M-I-T-Z-I-S-Z-E-R-E-T-O.com. And of course, we've got the three books, The Best New Cry True Crime Stories, Partners in Crime. I've got three of these listed. The Best of True Crime Stories, that would be The Crime and Passion. And the best two crime stories and well-mannered crooks. And of course, you know, Amazon always has everybody's books. So hopefully it's that way in this case. 